Hello and welcome. My name is Katie Clark from the California chapter of the Patrons. Today, we visit with Father Michael Collins from Dublin, Ireland, and we'll appreciate his talk on Christian art in Rome, two millennia of beauty and devotion. Today is the first in a four-part lecture series. Today we focus on the art of the catacombs, light from the shadows, exploring the world of early Christian art. Father Michael Collins is a priest from the Archdiocese of Dublin, Ireland, and is a well-renowned historian, art historian, and author, appearing at literary festivals on television and radio around the world. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, please welcome Father Michael Collins. Good afternoon, New York. Good afternoon, California. I'm delighted to be with you today to send, spend a little time discovering the glorious heritage of our Christian centuries. And today's lecture is dedicated to the memory of the late Florence Derso, who is a friend, first of all, but a wonderful patroness and supporter of the restoration programs in the Vatican Museums. And she had the privilege of restoring one of Raphael's great frescoes, Raphael, whose 500th anniversary we celebrate this year. Our story begins, in fact, 2,800 years ago. As far as we know from archaeological evidence, a little village was founded between seven hills in a valley coasting the Tiber River about 20 miles up from the Mediterranean seashore. Today we know it, of course, as Rome. It began in those between the, the seven hills and in the valley. And during that period of perhaps two or 300 years as it moved from a village into a town, it expanded in four principal areas, in politics, in commerce, in religion, and in laws. And thrown in on the side, there were advances in architecture. The Romans eventually were to discover concrete and the arch, which we all take for granted nowadays. For 300 years, they had a kingdom. For 400 years, they had a republic. And at the time of Jesus, whose memory we talk about and the heritage of which we celebrate this today, we find that the Romans also began an empire which was to last about 1400 years and have an extraordinary influence on our world even today. So this is a mock-up, if you like. It's a reconstruction of what the old Roman Forum must have looked like. In those days, people may have gone around the Forum. It was the, the town center. Uh, they would have gone to the temple to worship. They would have gone perhaps to listen to a speech outside the Senate House. They would have taken an interest in local elections. They also would have uh, heard their laws and cases and tribunals and they then would have changed their coinage for all the strangers who were coming in to this expanding Roman Empire. For in 27 BC, before the Christian era, a young man, Augustus, took power as the principal overseer, the emperor of the, of the new Roman experience. The emperor who probably is best known for us and for our story is this rather dubious character, Nero, elected in 54 and who reigned until 68. But there's a date that stands out for us as Christians and in our Christian history, which is quite important. And we'll meet him again next week when we visit St. Peter's. According to Tacitus, the emperor Nero was responsible for the first major pogrom against the Christians because on the night of the 19th of July in the year 64, the center of Rome around the Palatine, the palace, was destroyed by fire. The emperor, among his various jobs, had the title of being chief fire officer, so he was responsible for extinguishing fire. Wanting to move the blame for the fire from himself to somebody else, he found a new group, a newly arrived group of Jews called the followers of Crestus or Christians, and he moved the blame to them and began a series of brutal killings. The first piece of Christian art, I suppose we could say, dates somewhere around the second century. There's no date on this piece of work, and it was found in one of the barracks of the soldiers around the Palatine 
that I've just mentioned a moment ago, where Nero would have had his residence. It's very difficult to see what it is. It looks like scratches. But if we look at our next image, we'll find a drawing which takes out the idea uh, which this anonymous graffiti artist made uh, 1800 years ago. And we read that Anaximenus worships his God. Interestingly, it's written in Greek, and that was the language that a lot of Roman soldiers spoke at the time. Because at this stage, the empire was expanding into Greece, into France, into Spain, into the north of Africa, over to Turkey. And soldiers were coming along and being absorbed into the main, the head of the, the Roman experience, the Roman empire. So here we have a donkey, or a, it looks like a man with a donkey's head, on a cross, and he's been worshipped. And it's, it's guessed by some archaeologists that this may be some of the soldiers making fun of the soldier who worshipped the man who had been crucified. What do people look like in those days? Well, we don't really know, because there were no photographs. There was very, very little painting which has survived. If we didn't have uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum, we'd have virtually no idea of what people looked like 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire. But I'm going to show you some images which were excavated from an Egyptian site, a second to fourth century Egyptian site in Fayum. In, um, they were excavated, in fact, in the last century. And these are portraits which were placed on the mummies of the people who died. So because they were Egyptians, they were still Roman citizens, because remember, Egypt was a province of Rome. Everywhere really was a province of Rome. And a lot of people were quite glad. Look at this little boy. This almost is like a photograph of a child you would see today anywhere in the Middle East. Look at the old man to the left of your screen. It's very rare to find old men because the average age at that, at that time was around 40. If you got to 40, you were considered to be quite an old person, an elderly person. The little boy on the right-hand side of your screen is obviously more clearly an Egyptian. He still wears the little bulla, which a boy would have worn, and he has his locks shorn in the Egyptian style. You may notice as you look at these slides, most of them are of men, very few of women, and that again reflects the society in which people lived in those days. Women had two principal roles in the Roman world. One was to be a wife and the other was to be a mother. Other roles were all ancillary. Whether a woman was a slave or whether she was an aristocrat really depended on her birth, where she was born and her circumstances. But at all stages, the men were the people who held the power. And just think, in the Roman times, in order for a child to be legitimized, the father of the child uh, demanded that the, the infant would be laid at his feet. And then if he made a gesture to, bind, build, to, to pick up the child, that meant that he accepted it was legitimate and his child. If he turned his back in any way, that meant the child was not his and had to be exposed on the hills because even in those days, orphanages and care for children was very, very, very rare. But again, look at the different features of these people and you'll find that even though they're all born in a Roman province, they all have different faces. So we have actually very little painting and very little art that survives from these very early periods. There is one notable ex uh, exception. I've mentioned Pompeii and Herculaneum already, but there is one site in Syria, a place called Dura Oropas, which was a Roman garrison town. Originally, it had been Persian. It had belonged to a number of different civilizations, but it was taken over as a Roman town, a garrison town, where the army was stationed in the second century AD of the Christian era. And it remained so for about 150 years. It was finally abandoned in 257, and the Romans left it. But before that, they filled some of the buildings with clay and with sand in order to um, act as a bulwark. Fortunate for us, because afterwards the sands of time completely filled them in. And now we're looking in to an area which was entirely filled with sand. It's the old synagogue, the synagogue of Dura Oropus, dating from the, around the 240s, 250s. 
The walls are covered with fresco and they're covered interestingly with human images. Very rare in Jewish art because Jewish art prohibited the uh, depiction of humans because there was always the worry that could be, they could be honored as idols. At the very center, we've got the ark where the, uh, the little niche where the ark of the covenant was on, honored or the scroll of the ark of the covenant. Now at this stage, this was the place that Jewish people would worship once a week. Once they had seven men, they had a quorum and they were able to continue with their prayers. But this dating back 1800 years is one, one spectacular piece of art and we're very lucky to have it. We take a little look at one of the pieces. Here we have a scene divided in two. Moses is depicted twice, once on the right and once on the left. On the left, this is the story of Exodus. This is the Charleston Heston. And he is meeting the army of Pharaoh. They've been given permission by Pharaoh to leave Egypt. And he's leading the people out, the Hebrews, from their captivity of many years on their way to the promised land. And if you see all the soldiers of the, of the army lined up, they look more Roman than Egyptian. But nevertheless, that's the idea. And look underneath the fish. That's to indicate they're going to pass over the Red Sea or the Reed Sea. And then look over to our right-hand side. And once more, we have Moses. He's lifted up his baton. He's given the signal that God is to move the waters back over the army. And Pharaoh and his chariot and all his soldiers were drowned in the Red Sea. And of course, the Egyptians saw this as a complete and utter defeat. And the Hebrews saw this as their liberation. Interestingly, apart from the Bible, there's no other literary evidence, there's no archaeological evidence that this ever took place. But nevertheless, for us, it's part of the Christian story. I mentioned that the Jewish people would gather in the synagogue. Why didn't they go to the temple? Well, the temple, the great temple of Solomon, had been destroyed in 70 AD by Titus, the emperor's son, and by Vespasian at his command. Here we have Aaron, and his name is just uh, inscribed above the hooded figure. He's the brother of Moses. He's dressed as a priest because that was his role. And he's actually standing on the, uh, he's standing on the temple. You see the menorah, the seven-branched candlestick. You see the golden doors with the, the curtain blowing open. And you see the columns at the top. That is to indicate the, the temple. And here are the animals being brought in for slaughter. Now, where were the Christians? We know that the Christians had a church here, but unfortunately, most of the church has been destroyed. And archaeologists from Yale University uh, excavated this in the last century. And they discovered one part that has remained still preserved, reasonably preserved. It's not much, but it's better than nothing. And this is the baptistry, because in the old days, beside every church, there was a special building called the baptistry. To become a Christian, to enter into the Christian way of life, was considered an enormous uh, move. People prepared for 40 days before Easter, and then they were received on Holy Saturday night into the church. Infant baptism was quite rare. Normally people were catechumens or adults who would make the request to become Christians. On the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a jar with water, and you'll see a little basin. That's where the Christians would take off their clothes during the rite of initiation. They would get into the water, and that was the moment of their baptism. And they quoted a passage from St. Paul's letter, if you have died with Christ, you also shall rise with him in glory. So baptism, if you like, was seen as a mini death and a preparation for eternal life. Over on the side, we see two women, which we're going to see a detail of now. The Gospels indicate that three women came to the tomb early on Easter morning in order to anoint the body of Jesus, which had been taken down on the Sabbath evening because the sun was setting and it was against the law to leave bodies exposed after sundown. So the women had waited until the Sabbath was over and early on what we call Sunday morning, they'd made their way to the tomb. Here they're carrying torches and that's to indicate that this is 
before dawn and the sun is just barely rising in the sky. To the left hand side you'll see the corner of the mausoleum or the sarcophagus of Jesus which obviously has not been preserved but we're very lucky even to get these small images, these little hints of what early Christian art must have looked like. It's thought that these are the earliest pieces of Christian art outside Rome. The artist here probably is not of the same calibre that we're going to meet in other places and certainly during the flowering of Christian Rome. What scene do we have here? This is a scene in two parts. Again, we see a man, if you can imagine, uh, standing on the upper right hand corner. This is Jesus, who's indicating to a man who is lying on a bed. And this is the story taken from the Gospels when a paralytic calls out to Jesus to be healed and to ask for his help. And Jesus says to him, rise up and take your bed and walk. And so then on the left-hand side of the slide, we'll see the man taking up his bed. Maybe the perspective isn't absolutely perfect, but it was enough to get the image across. Sadly, all the colors have faded of this image. But again, it's 1800 years old. It was covered with sand and I think we should be just grateful that we even have it today. Now we're going to move to Rome, which by this stage had become the absolute center of the empire. In the second century, it had reached its apogee. It was really at the, the most enormous expanse. It ran up to, to England, almost to Scotland. It didn't come to Ireland. It went to Spain, all across the northern coast of Africa and then over into Palestine, Syria, Mesopotamia, Turkey, all, all this area called itself uh, the Roman peace, the Pax Romana. And they were actually subdued by the Roman soldiers, clearly. But at the same time, to be a Roman citizen was quite an achievement because the Romans ruled by giving the peoples whom they subjugated a lot of freedom. Just, I'll take one example out of the air. Many people would have their local gods, their local religions, their local devotions, and the Romans didn't destroy them. On the contrary, the Romans were very interested in the other peoples that they came across, many of whom uh, did not have the same language and they couldn't even understand them, so they'd make a good effort to try and communicate with them. But once they made their arrangements, the commercial, financial, religious, and judicial arrangements, these people became part of the Pax Romana, part of the Roman experience. And the Romans then were very interested and they imported a lot of gods and goddesses, cults and religions into their empire. One of the things we find is the Romans uh, did not believe in burying the dead within the city and that was for hygienic reasons. We've seen a Roman road there. The Roman road of course is the artery throughout the empire and that is the secret of their success because they could dispatch armies very quickly in squadrons and cohorts easily to su suppress any rebellions that they may have. But if you were in, coming into Rome in the old days it wouldn't have been quite a black and white image like this but all the roads were lined with uh, mausolea and these were memorials to people who had died. Some were imperial people, some were aristocrats, but people of wealth anyway. And these were all placed outside the pomerium, outside the city boundaries, outside the city walls. The Christians in the first couple of centuries weren't really people of any great means. The majority of them were Greek speaking, the majority of them came from outside Rome, and the majority of them were of the lower, what we would call the lower classes, the serving classes. Nevertheless, it's only the Christian catacomb, it's only the Christian burial place which has survived and gives us this extraordinary glimpse into what life was like 2,000 years ago. I've just shown you a slide which shows us if we were looking down from a drone. This is a slide slice uh, which was made by an archaeologist in the 18th century and it shows us what a cross-section of the Roman catacombs was like. Now the word catacombs comes from by the quarry. And it gives us an indication also that the original burial places for the Christians were in the soft tufa stone, the soft stone uh, on which Rome was built. It was almost like a volcanic uh, ash stone. So it was very easy to excavate. And if you look from the top, we've got a mausoleum. And then we go down a little, maybe uh, six feet, 
and the, we find a gallery. The people were brought down and the corpses were interred here. And then when they needed more space, they just dug downwards. And once they got to that level that they couldn't go any further, they would dig down again. Because land, as today, was real estate. It was very expensive. So this was the way they looked after their uh, burials. Burials always took place at night time. Uh, a mass was celebrated before that. This is a 19th century French artist who gives us a kind of an idealized image. A martyr has been brought into the catacombs. His body has been laid on a rug. You know he's a martyr because there's the palm of martyrdom across his body. Keep in mind that from the time of Nero until the early fourth century, Christians were persecuted throughout the empire, not in the exaggerated numbers that we would claim nowadays in actual fact. Not a huge amount, amount of Christians died. Most of them tried to stay under the radar. But here we have the uh, idealized burial ceremony taking place, and the martyrs being brought in, and the Bishop of Rome celebrating prayers for their burial. Today, if you go down into the catacombs, this is the scene you're going to see. Today, there's electricity. When I was living in Rome years ago, we had to go every Thursday for class to study the catacombs. And it was a pretty scary experience because the ones that we went to hadn't been excavated. So therefore, there was no electricity. And we went down with our torches. And I remember on one occasion, the battery on my torch went. I was using a rechargeable battery like every student would. And it just suddenly went out. And amazingly, it's so quiet down below. And there were only six other students in the group, six or eight other students. And suddenly, I was completely on my own. And that was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Because unfortunately, uh, I could have been left there, or maybe fortunately, for the rest of my days. In the Roman experience, people were cremated rather than uh, buried. The, the Romans preferred the idea of cremating their bodies, burning them. And then they were stored in little jars, which were insert, inserted in niches. And this is called a columbarium, meaning a dove coat. And in, indeed, you can imagine the pigeons with the doves coming in to take their, their rest. And this was the final, the refrigerium, the final place where people were laid to rest. The pagans followed this, the ordinary Romans followed this uh, style of burial, but the Jews and the Christians preferred inhumation, that's burial in the ground, both for religious reasons and also the Romans themselves, possibly because of Christian influence, uh, began to, uh, they began to bury in the ground rather than continue with cremation. Now, the catacombs. There's about 40 catacombs underneath the, the streets of Rome today. They expand for almost 600, 600 acres. In fact, we know there's many, many more catacombs and crypts and galleries which have not been explored because if you dig a hole anywhere in Rome, you'll be stopped. There's nothing you can do because if you, if you go exploring, there's always going to be something that will be unearthed. And in 1578, a young Maltese called Antonio Bosio heard about some farmers who were digging on their land one of the farmers fell through a hole and into a cubicle. And when he looked around him, he found that he was in a burial place. And this, of course, is one of the early catacombs. So Bosio was very interested in antiquities. This is the time post-Renaissance, but still people were very, very interested in Latin and Greek inscriptions and learning about their history of their ancestors. So Bosio led a party of three or four friends, and they came and did a very interesting exploration of the galleries, all of which had been uh, abandoned. Why had they been abandoned? Well, in the sixth century, the Roman Empire had fallen into decay in the West. The barbarians were invading. Many of the barbarians, in fact, looted the tombs and whatever valuables had been uh, hidden away in the catacombs were taken. And then they fell into disuse. They were no longer used. So unless a few pilgrims would come to visit the catacombs, uh, they were virtually abandoned. This is the catacomb of Domitilla, who is a wealthy Roman matroness who left some of her properties for the burial site of the Christians. This is a very important one because it's a large cubicle. The poor people were simply buried in a slot in the wall, 
but this belonged to a family of bakers and it's called the, the uh, Crypt of the Bakers. You'll notice as we go through the catacombs, they use very simple colors. We'll have ochre and terracotta, which are red and yellow colors. They're the principal colors because, as you can see from this slide, everything was dark. The fossori, or the grave digger, who was the man responsible for the excavation of the catacomb and the designation of various places for the people who, who bought a place to bury their dead. Um, he was the one who was responsible for the, the whole catacomb, the whole burial system, and he employed the painters. Well, this is a place underground. This is a place where dead people are. So therefore, they didn't put a great amount of work into their art because it could only be seen by candlelight. Nonetheless, from time to time, we find some beautiful paintings which were of a very high quality. And here is Jesus passing on his authority to the 12 apostles. And in his hand, he's holding a, a manuscript or a roll. And this is called the Traditio Legis, the handing on of the teaching of, of authority to the apostles. Now, unfortunately, right above, Bosio left his name. So can you imagine somebody in the late 16th century deciding to say Bosio was here? Well, this is about as good as it gets. The paintings in the catacombs are divided into two categories easily. One is from the Old, the Old Testament and the other is from the New Testament. I'm going to show you a few scenes from the Old Testament and the one that's most readily recognized is Adam and Eve. As you can see, uh, the tree is at the center. Adam is on our left hand side and Eve is on our right hand side. And you know the story of the little boy who asked the teacher, did sin come into the world because of the tree, the apple on the tree? And the teacher said, no, it wasn't the apple on the tree, it was the pear on the ground. So nevertheless, we have here Adam and Eve already showing a little remorse for having disobeyed God. The only thing he asked them not to do was take a fruit from the tree of knowledge. And because of their disobedi disobedience, as John Milton says, sin entered the world. There's a very large uh, area of several cubicula which open one into the other in the catacomb of Priscilla, another generous lady who donated her land for the burial place of her fellow Christians. A few things we could notice. On the lower ground, on the lower uh, area, you'll find square panels. They're actually painted fresco, but they're painted in such a way that they look like marble, first style Roman marble. You'll find in the next register above that some little daubings, some little paintings. And these were again were little uh, beginnings of iconography. On the right hand side, you'll also see a plasterwork, a stucco uh, tendril like uh, the acanthus plant. And that just shows that a certain amount of money and effort went into this, into the preparation of this chamber. We see three young boys in a fiery furnace. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar in the fifth century BC had asked the Jewish people to offer a pinch of incense to worship the gods. These three boys had refused and so they were thrown into a furnace. And you'll see the, the flames are beginning to uh, devour the boys, but it seems as if they're going to be burnt alive, but in fact they emerge unscathed because God has saved them. And this was obviously. Um, something very pertinent for Christians who were going through a period of persecution at the time. Another story was the liberation of Jonah. In the Old Testament, we hear of Jonah, uh, who is persecuted by people, and he's thrown out of a boat and swallowed by a whale. And here we have this extraordinary sea monster. Well, think of it. No Roman had ever seen a whale. They'd only heard of whales. So they'd no idea what they looked like. But it was a sea monster anyway, and lived in the Mediterranean as far as they were concerned. So here we see Jonah being thrown out and dumped into the sea and being swallowed by the whale, where he remained for three days. And Jesus used this very image again when he was talking about his resurrection. He said, this is like the sign of Jonah that I'm going to give you. For three days I'll be gone, like Jonah in the belly of the whale. 
And of course, afterwards, the Christians, when they thought about that after the death and resurrection of Christ, they uh, interpreted it this, that Christ meant he was going to rise from the dead after his own brutal death and persecution. We have another rare vision of a lady. Uh, again, I mentioned when we saw the portraits of fame a few moments ago, we don't really know what the Romans looked like, but this lady obviously uh, was well uh, endowed because she had beautiful hair, lovely coiffed hair, a veil. She clearly had jewelry. And her name was Dionysias. We see on the, right, on the left hand side, Dionysias in pace, Dionysias rest in peace. And that was the great salutation of the early Christians. What they wanted was at the end of our lives that we would all leave this world and go to a place of peace and rest. From the year around 230 to 250, we have in the catacomb of Priscilla one of the early uh, depictions of the Annunciation. This is interpreted as Mary seated on the left-hand side on a, on a throne or on a chair, receiving a visit from the Archangel Gabriel, who asks if she will assent to become the mother of the Saviour. Another painting, which is almost at the same time, it doesn't seem to be in very good condition, as you can imagine, but that's because the colours have bled and faded. And again, keep in mind, these have been 1800 years, almost 1750, 1800 years underground. It's where it's dark and humid. So at least we've got the outline. And here again, we have Mary with the Christ child at the breast, and then an unknown figure, uh, which has not been identified. Perhaps it's the, the soul or the person of uh, the sarcophagus which was placed below. Another contemporaneous image, this is found in the Greek chapel of uh, the catacomb of Priscilla. Mary is seated on the right hand side, again indicating holding her child, and three figures approach her, and these are interpreted as the wise men. In the Gospels, it doesn't say there were three wise men. It just says that men came from the East in order to uh, pay homage to the Christ child. And interestingly enough, I noticed that they're dressed in white, red, and green, which are the colors of Italy, but that is purely a coincidence. Now we have uh, a further view of the cubiculum. And you'll see images uh, again on the side, all of which were to inspire Christian hope. But here's the thing, not everybody in a family became a Christian. So you can imagine that sometimes there were people who became Christians, other times they decided not to become Christian, but they were all buried together. In this cubiculum, we have a lovely image and it gives us an idea. Once more on the right hand side, we have the three boys in the burning furnace. And now we see the shepherd, Christ as the good shepherd, who looks after his sheep. And the figure of the woman whose body was buried in this catacomb is shown in three poses. The first on the left-hand side with the marriage to her husband. On the right, we see her in life. And in the center, we see her being presented to God, holding her hands high in prayer. And that was the traditional way that people prayed in the past, holding their hands up, the Oran's position. But again, isn't this a marvellous painting? Look at her face, look at the eyes, and even the light, 1800 years, still catches her face. Jesus is presented as the good shepherd so often because he referred to himself as a shepherd and the people who, were, who followed him as his sheep. So it was a very close analogy because in the time of Jesus in Palestine, the shepherd and the sheep was an analogy with, with which a lot of people could identify. And of course, it indicated the care that the shepherd had to count his 100 sheep. And if even one went away, he left the 99 in order to care for the one which had strayed. Jesus was often portrayed as a young bearded, uh, beardless youth in the early days. But by the fourth century, we have Jesus becoming much more somber he's bearded, and he's also much more regal. He's dressed here as a Roman, 
but we have the alpha and the omega in Greek, the A and the Z sign, the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet, because St. Paul described Jesus as the beginning and the end. Here he is once more seated in glory, and he is passing on the law, the traditio legis, to the uh, apostle Peter and to the disciple Paul, and underneath are a number of other martyrs. This is a lovely image taken from the New Testament. This is the baptism of Jesus. St. John has been obliterated, unfortunately. And here we have Jesus standing in the Jordan, but he looks actually as if he's standing in the shower. And an enormous big bird, which is supposed to represent the Holy Spirit, a dove, descends with a shower of water for his baptism. This is another uh, depiction of Jesus healing the woman who had a hemorrhage. And this again is a passage you'll recognize from the Gospels. A woman who'd been afflicted with the hemorrhage for so many years said, if I can only touch the garment of Jesus. Now here the artist is obviously slightly better quality. He's been able to get uh, the proportions much better. And even though he's used just very light colors and one tint, he nevertheless gives us an indication of the message. And the final one we look at is the story of the woman at Samaria. Jesus in, at, the, at the well of Samaria opening uh, the well and talking to a woman who's coming to fill the, 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 the bucket with water. And look at this wonderful face. Again, it's almost like a cartoon. It's almost like uh, a person that we would recognize. Finally, we come to the Eucharist, the agape. And we have some people celebrating an agape, or a friendship feast, which is also seen as a portrait or a, uh, an indication of the Eucharist. And the one which is probably most readily visible to us and uh, strikes a chord in our mind is the fish. Jesus, who is uh, the fish. In Greek, that means Jesus. The word fish means Jesus. Uh, it spells out the word Jesus, the savior of mankind but also would remind us of the miracle of the loaves and fishes. The quality of, of workmanship was extraordinary in those days. This is a pagan piece of glass, but the next two the slides that we're going to see shows how the Christians used Christian themes. These were also found in the catacombs. Here, Jonah is taking his rest underneath the tree. And in our next slide, we find Jesus crowning Justice and Timothy to unknown uh, people from the New Testament. Things changed when Constantine came along. Constantine was a great emperor who in 313 allowed the Christians to practice their religion in safety. And we'll come to Constantine next week. But immediately after Constantine, when he gave that permission, people were able to worship in public. Here we have a magnificent sarcophagus of the Roman prefect Junius Bassus dating from around 347 to 350. He was the prefect of the city. He was the, he was the mayor of the city. And these are carved in marble. Here's Abraham carrying out his sacrifice of his son. And here we have Jesus on the left panel being presented to Pilate, who's scratching his head and wondering what he should do as a headless figure is about to help him wash his hands of the death of Christ. Once more, we find Adam and Eve on our right-hand panel, and Job had been comforted by those who wished him ill on our left-hand panel. Now we move to the, the daughter of Constantine. Not only could the Romans practice, but the daughters of the emperor were very happy to uh, practice their faith, and they built a mausoleum where they would be buried. Constantia and Helena intended to be buried here Probably they weren't, in fact, buried. But look at the magnificent mosaics on the ceiling, how, how colorful they are. This is late antiquity. It's not purely Christian because we find little putti or little angels who are carrying out the, the pressing of the vine, which is a very common theme at that time. And that theme of the pressing of the vine, of the vine is, and of the grapes is taken up in this image, the sarcophagus of either Constantia or of Helena. There's no name written on it, so we can only make a guess. This is a lovely capsule made of ivory 
ivory, of course, nowadays is a prohibited material. But this is from the fourth century, and it shows at the center a woman being brought into the presence of the magistrate accused of being a Christian, and she has to defend herself. And on the right hand part of the main panel, you'll see her being taken away where she's going to be uh, executed. And there's a great amount of movement here. And once more, we find our friend Jonah resting underneath the pergola tree. You might wonder why we haven't seen a crucifix, or we haven't seen Jesus crucified with all this Christian art in the catacombs. And that's because it didn't exist. There was no image of Christ crucified until the fourth century. And in 332, at the Church of Santa Sabina, at its dedication, the doors were placed and this wooden panel, which goes back to the fourth century, uh, shows Jesus in the presence of two thieves crucified on either side. Now, this wooden panel is an original, and it dates from sometime around 440. The emperors continued on their care of the empire. Uh, here we have Theodosius who in 380 allowed Christianity complete freedom and decided that it would become the official religion of the empire. And he also gave them an enormous amount of money. 10 years later, he, he closed all the Roman temples and any building we have from there on, a religious building is always a Christian building. Here we have the mausoleum of the daughter of Theodosius, Gala Placidia, but as we enter in, we have St. Lawrence, a third century martyr who was killed at the catacombs with the Bishop of Rome, Sixtus. And on our left hand side, you'll see a closet or a wardrobe or a little press where four gospels of the story of, of the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are placed. Interestingly, they now are using books because it was the Christian who invented the books. They abandoned the papyrus scroll and we have Lawrence holding his uh, version of the scriptures and a cross and the griddle uh, indicates where he's been burned and the story says that when he's been burned by his persecutors he said you can turn me over now I'm done on this side and look at the magnificent roof of this this is all mosaic this is all blue stone lapis lazuli which go could only be mined in Afghanistan at that time Lapis lazuli, ultramarine, one of the most precious colors, as precious as gold. And look at this wonderful roof with the cross, without the figure of Christ, surrounded by images of the Gospels. Christ is once more depicted as the Good Shepherd. Again, he has no beard. And we see in this magnificent mosaic, a contraposta, that he's turning towards the viewer uh, in an S shape. And again, just examine the beauty of the colors of these tiny little tesserae. The ones at the very center are made of gold because this is a divine figure. So the glass is, is uh, poured, the molten glass is poured over gold leaf. Then it's cut up into small squares and made into this applique. Another beautiful church from the middle of the sixth century dedicated in 547 is the Church of San Vitale, one of the early martyrs of the city of Ravenna. And as we go in, we see this extraordinary burst of color. Look at the magnificent mosaics which cover every single surface of the wall. There's magnificent colors, there's wonderful figures, there's tremendous light as we go into this building. Now again, think of somebody comes from their little ordinary house to worship in this church. It must have been so stunning. Today we're saturated with images. We look everywhere. All we've got posters. We've got with a saturation. We're almost exhausted with everything that we see visually. But to come into a space like this, especially from the austere, unordained exit, and then to see this image of the divine. Here we have Christ seated on a globe, which is a natural fact, like a blue ocean. He's attended by two angels. He hands to our left-hand side the crown to, of martyrdom to St. Vitalis. And on the right-hand side, we have an image of the bishop, Ecclesius, who is giving a model of the church of St. Vitalik to Christ. And again, 
look at this wonderful image of the beardless Christ. It looks as if he's wearing brown, but in actual fact, he's wearing purple. Imperial purple was reserved only for the emperor. And as you know, that imperial purple, the indigo, comes from the secretions of a sea snail, which is found in, in Tyre in Syria. Again, a wonderful mosaic that we want to pause and look at in three stages. This is the visit of three men, unusual visitors, to Sarah and to Abraham. And when we see these figures, Abraham offers his hospitality to the three men, the three guests. He doesn't know who they are. They sit down and they accept his hospitality. And then before they leave, they say he will have a son. And so Sarah bears a son within the year. God says, I want you to sacrifice your son. And Abraham says, but why would you do this? This is, my only, this is the son, the one I love. And God puts him to the test because just as Abraham is about to obey him, God holds his hand by an angel and then provides uh, an animal which was sacrificed in, in their stead. Going into the baptistry, we saw that tiny baptistry in Dura Europa, dating from the middle of the 3rd century. Now we're in one in the 5th century. A magnificent mo mosaic decorates the ceiling. And again, we have the apostles gathering around this wonderful roundel of Jesus. The Holy Spirit now uh, has a much better shower, I think, to... to uh, baptized Jesus with. But look at the way the Jordan is represented, that he's standing in the, in the water. On the left-hand side, we find the figure of the Jordan, because the Romans were so used to uh, making figures of rivers, of mountains, etc. That's the figure of the Jordan. And on the right-hand side, we have the cousin of Jesus, John the Baptist. Now, these have been slightly restored in the, in the 19th century, so they're not as perfect as they would have been had they not been touched. We come to the last church that I wanted to show you today on our visual tour of the early decades and centuries of Christian history. I mentioned a few moments ago that the Romans, uh, the early Christians, worshipped in very, very simple houses, each other's living rooms almost. But once Constantine gave permission for them to worship in public, and once Christianity became the religion of the empire, in the late fourth century, the Christians could do what they wanted. This is one of the uh, forms of church that they built. It's a nave with two side aisles at the center. Uh, we have columns, which are taken from an old public building, which have been deserted. We have a clerestory on top, uh, which allows light. So it's a very luminous building. But as we progress into the building, we'll find a wonderful mosaic, a wonderful uh, image of heaven with which we're going to conclude. Underneath we have uh, an image of Saint Apollinari, one of the first martyred saints of the city of Ravenna. He's surrounded by sheep, they are to indicate his flock. The trees remind us of the Garden of Eden, which was as far as the early Christians were concerned, the place that they wanted to be, the place where they wanted to go to. And as we rise up, we see uh, shining almost like the sun, this gem and jeweled cross. Again, all of this is in mosaic. And the figures of the angels indicate that we are about to witness our vision of heaven. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your presence this afternoon and I hope you enjoyed our first visit to the treasures of Christianity and next week we'll have the opportunity of exploring St. Peter's underneath and finding what Constantine built in the first shrine of St. Peter. All right Father Michael we have some questions that have come in so we're going to take as many of these as we can. As we start Please. to answer questions, um, feel free to go ahead and submit any other questions you have into your Q&A box. The first one we have is a question about the synagogue that we looked at at the beginning of your talk. And we wanted to know, has that survived the wars in Syria? Yes, it has, fortunately. Thank goodness, because uh, as you know, many of the sites have been damaged and have been destroyed. 
but um, large portions also have been taken to the United States for safekeeping because uh, Yale University, as I mentioned, carried out some of the excavations. So, um, as you know, the importance of museums is also to harbor places and to offer shelter for treasures which cannot be left in their original site. Thank you. We have a question about the mosaics at Rav in Ravenna. Um, Michael wants to know if they were influenced by the Byzantine style. Yes, they were completely because the old Romans uh, used the style of um, late antiquity, but the Byzantines certainly had a different way of depicting the, the human figure. Very big into impressing, size mattered. So everything that you see uh, would, would be influenced by the, the way in which the uh, Byzantine court, which was hugely ceremonial, was depicted. And that's why Jesus is, would no longer be depicted as a simple shepherd sitting on a rock. He would have to wear the imperial purple that I mentioned a moment ago. Thank you. Angela wants to know, how did archaeologists determine that the crypt of the bakers belonged to a family of bakers? Well, you know, it was actually quite simple. It's because when you look at the inscriptions, um, the inscriptions on the graves of the people who died usually indicated what they did in life. So you were called Pat the Postman, um, Cyril the Carpenter, uh, Jenny the Gym Instructor, etc. So that's the way. And uh, in the, in the uh, curriculum of the bakers, there were various indications that bakers, a family of bakers, in fact, were buried there. About he wants to know, are there any symbols characteristic of the memento mori, so skeletons or depictions of death in the catacombs? No, not really, no. Um, for example, if we time, I didn't want to overload with images today, but a very common uh, depiction you'll find is an anchor. And the anchor uh, Cyril of Alexandria refers to as being the cross of Christ turned upside down and catching the fish in the sea. So it's this wonderful poem in which he talks about the, uh, the cross of Christ turned upside down to make an anchor to pull, in to, uh, pull the faithful into the net of Christ. But the idea of the memento mori and, and this, the, uh, the bones doesn't exist in the catacombs in the Roman and Christian tradition. We have another question about some of the early portraits that you showed us. Um, and I think this is a reference to the sarcophagus portraits from Egypt. Do you know if they used encaustic wax as part of the process they, or they only did pigment? That, no, no, no. All of those used encaustic wax, which is an extraordinary uh, way of painting. So principally what the, the artists did was they took the pigments. And remember, in those days, you couldn't buy a tube of pigment. So you had to ground your colors. If it was a stone color, a mineral color, um, whatever, you ground it with your base and the base was melted wax. So uh, that meant that you, you covered the part of, of wood that you wanted to paint with, uh, with wax. You covered that maybe seven or eight times to make a base. And then on the last time before you were about to paint, you heated the wax once more and you used wax as your medium. So you, you put your paintbrush into wax, then into your, uh, into your pigment. And that had to be done, of course, very, very quickly because the encaustic wax um, would dry very quickly. And that's why, they, that's why they have that kind of almost a 3D quality. And of course, that's why they survived so well over almost 2000 years. We've got a question about the church with the lapis mosaics. Can you just remind us where that was? With the? The, the lapis mosaic uh, oh, church, that, so that, with the ceiling that, and the... Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's the mausoleum of Gala Placidia. Uh, that's the, the one that we had, St. Lawrence and the Grill, if you remember. And that, yeah, again, you know, I'd say to everybody who's listening, uh, go online, look up, if you put anything in your search box and go for images, and especially uh, Wiki Commons, you find amazing uh, images of everything that we've seen today and a myriad more to explore. 
And in answer to one of the uh, other questions we got, we'll have a recording of this talk available later and we'll make sure that the names of the churches are included. So if you wanna go and have a look, you can, you can do that easily. Uh, we have a question about the sea snail dye for uh, imperial purple garments. You said that it was from Tyre, Syria. Is this the same as Tyre, Lebanon? Yes, yes. Uh, so basically, there, these are sea snails. There's um, it's a sea snail, and when it dries, it, it gives you that indigo, and that's used in the dyeing trade. It's an extraordinary thing, but it was it was hugely, um, you know, it required an enormous amount of work from the slaves who were, who were producing this. And that's why it was reserved only for the, uh, for the emperor. And curiously, that's the same reason that porphyry, you know, that stone, we saw the sarcophagus probably that belonged to Helena or Constantia um, from the mid fourth century. Equally, that porphyry is only found in Egypt the only place that was ex excavated in Mons Claudius in Egypt. And it's the only place that you'll find it. And that indicates whenever you find it, you, you know that this was an imperial building, uh, an imperial structure. And when you walk into St. Peter's, no, I'll, I'm not going to tell you now. I'll, I'll tell you next Saturday when we meet again, uh, and I'll show you the extraordinary uh, dedication stone of St. Peter's. So we've got time for just one more question, although we have several extra. Um, and it's, I'm going to combine two questions into one, which is, uh, why are there no images of Christ on the cross before the wood card that you showed? And when did the body of Christ start being displayed um, in art as yes. crucified? Yes, yes. Oh, very, very interesting question. Um, the first answer is we don't really know, but we do know that the early Romans and the early Christians saw crucifixion as punishment because only slaves and uh, really bad criminals were were crucified think of spartacus think of um well jesus is probably the one that we'd most readily uh, identify with but it was a punishment death uh, a roman citizen was allowed to take their own life by either slitting their veins or by uh, putting a sword through their their innards uh, they were allowed to commit suicide but for the early christians the cross was an absolute shame. It was only probably in the fourth century when more theologians, more, let's say, religious thinkers were working out, well, what did the sufferings of Christ mean? What, how could it be that God would want his son to die? And they were making that connection between Abraham and his son. And um, when we come in our fourth lecture, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the Sistine Chapel and the way in which Moses is seen as prefiguring Christ. And therefore, in the second part to your question, the uh, depiction of Jesus represented as uh, suffering on the cross really is something medieval. You, you don't find it until the medieval time because right through the uh, sixth century, you'll find the, the cross with gems and with jewels. But unfortunately, um, and we'll talk about this on another occasion, about less than 100 years after that last church that we visited of St. Apollinari, um, we have the rise of Islam and the armies of Muhammad uh, began a rather destructive westward movement across the north of Africa up into old Syria and Mesopotamia and sadly much of Christian art was destroyed. Thank you so much, Father Michael. Uh, there are several questions we didn't have a chance to get to, but we will make sure that we send you a response via email. I, so I'll just, write them. I'll write them. Yeah, sure. yeah. We'll, get, we'll get those to you. So Thanks it so remains much. only for me to thank you, Father Michael, to thank all of our attendees who joined us today. Thank you so much. And especially thank you to the California Northwest chapters, as well as the New York chapter, for their generous sponsorship of this series. We hope you'll join us next week at the same time for the second lecture in our series. And if you're not one of our patrons, you're welcome to visit californiapatrons.org slash lecture series to learn more about the other talks in this series as well as how to become a patron. And if you are, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>